everybody who's working out in private practice, you, you are your own boss. Like, it, but yet there's that still overwhelming sense of duty and across the board, everybody's burnt out and working too much. Like, does it come down to wanting to make more money? Is it patient care? Where do you find people wind up getting that like cognitive distortion and then just burning themselves out? Mm -hmm. I think it's both of those things and maybe a different answer for different people. I think there's some people um, who imagined a lifestyle you know, that like the big house with the picket fence and all of the trips and the cottage and all of those things. And so they do overwork so that they can have a lifestyle that they thought they were getting. I for sure think that's a very real thing. Um, and I think that we also, by nature of going into healthcare, being someone who's drawn to healthcare, it's a community of people pleasers. And we are perfectionists, we are people pleasers, and we are overachievers. And we have some kind of like dopamine hit when we're doing more and more and more and saying that we're really, you know, great and accomplishing so much. But the reality is like that to-do list never ends. Your list of patients will never end. And the only way that you will ever feel like you're, you know, done or satisfied or I don't like the word balance, but say like proper harmony in your personal life and your professional life is when you get really good at boundaries. And until you start working on that, like nobody's going to do that for you. We're never going to get to a place where, you know, the government says like, this is an appropriate patient load for you. And once you hit this many patients, you stop, we're not going to give you any more. Like there's always going to be more to do. I've never met anyone in my life who doesn't have something on their to-do list at that moment. So the only way in your personal life and in your professional life and your clinical life that you're going to be able to feel good about all of the things you're doing is when you set boundaries and you hold yourself accountable for them. And until then, you're going to feel overwhelmed and burnt out all the time. I wonder if that's maybe part of the design of needing, you know, the 3.9 GPA to get into pharmacy in the first place. You know, it sort of self-selects for those type A workaholics. Absolutely. And then now it's like, oh, OK, this is why we're all in the same boat together. It was maybe some of that initial selection criteria. Absolutely. And like there's it's been interesting watching. I have a bit of perspective into the different schools and university programs and have watched them change over time. Um, in pharmacy and otherwise. But it's interesting, like even when you see students midway through a program where a program changes from grade based to pass fail and the the lack of like that positive reinforcement of getting an A or a B is just like it's destroying some students like you pass. Good. See for career. Like li there's no doctor, pharmacist, anybody that I've ever known who got out into practice and had somebody ask them what their graduating GPA was. It's like, are you breathing? Do you have a license? Do you seem like a good human? Cool. You're hired. You know, nobody's like, well, like, what was your GPA? They, they don't really matter. I think we need to be able to select for people that, um, you know, people that have the personalities for healthcare and the desire to help, but also the personal power skills that you need to be um, able to survive a career in healthcare. And we don't do a good job of screening for those things um, at all. And I don't know if it's the same in the pharmacy side of things, but the attrition rate in medical school is virtually none. Like hardly anybody ever actually dropped out or failed out. And so, you know, is it really that big of an issue to, you know, have to be those straight A students every time? Or should you start incorporating more people with more life experience, more diverse skill sets? And I would add like life experience, diverse skill sets, even geographical diversity. I don't think we do a good enough job of having like our rural versus urban um, admissions process. Um, I, they do account for that at some schools now, but not not as much as we need. When we're having such a crisis staffing remote and rural areas, you know, why are we not figuring out how to spend at least some of the time training in communities, um, you know, doing some of that differently? Like, you look at some of the other programs that are out there, and it would be more difficult for really hands-on programs, but we learned how to teach virtually. We have the technology that's available. Is it possible to have people stay in their own community learning half of the year and then on-site half the year or even mm -hmm. less on-site throughout the year so that people can continue to live in their communities while they're learning some of these? And then they will probably be more likely to stay in their communities as well. Um, we have the tools. We're just not taking advantage of them to provide for our communities the way we need to.
I'm Dr. Jordan Valrath, and you've been watching Cherry Live, brought to you by Cherry Health. Please like and subscribe to see more clips like this, or check us out at www.cherry.health, Canada's medical network.